missing crocodile teeth, certainly the per precursors, precursors of a turban as a bomb. Usually my colleagues don't go out of their way to kick a clergyman. However, when the clergy ask for special privileges, demand special tax cuts, or are just especially misbehaving, we take notice. This Pat Oliphant, the running of the altar boys, <laughs> You're cutting into my time. Stop <laughs> laughing. It was embraced by many lay Catholics, but bitterly denounced by official Catholicism. Note to church leaders, if you don't want your clerics ridiculed as child abusers, make sure they don't abuse children. Had Americans been able to see the Danish cartoons, they would have noted that they, too, were not just gratuitous attacks on the faithful. One was making fun of the idea that after blowing up innocent people, suicide bombers would be rewarded with virgins in heaven. If you can't make fun of that, what can you make fun of? <laughs> what really enraged believers wasn't that Muhammad was pictured, but that he was pictured negatively. To test the point, at the height of the controversy, I put Muhammad in this cartoon, the big fat book of offensive religious cartoons. <laughs> He's third from the right, flanked by Jesus and God and a few other laughing deities. No one protested this because no one cared about Muhammad being drawn as jolly and benign. However, I have been picketed without putting Muhammad in a cartoon. Radical Islam sponsors the Miss Muslim World Contest. <laughs> Miss Illiteracy, Miss Can't Vote, Miss Waiting to be Stoned. And when, and when I say picketed, I mean picketed, including, <laughs> including by one of my daughter's high school history teachers. <laughs> so, but um, Muslims aren't alone in their selective outrage. My Jewish readers were okay with a drawing with the Star of David that was pro-Israel, but roasted me for one that criticized a local Jewish senator who was attacking his opponent for being anti-Semitic. Critics said that the Star of David was off limits, unless apparently it was used to make a point that they agreed with. What critics of offensive cartoons forget is that every time I exercise my free speech, my readers exercise theirs swiftly and loudly. For that last little sketch with the Star of David, our paper received and printed weeks of vilifying letters. The Anti-Defamation League denounced me, I was called a Nazi, and the senator's son helpfully suggested to my editors how they could better use my talents. <laughs> One re reader wrote that I was worthy of Hustler magazine, which at my age I take as something of a compliment. <laughs> Speaking of Hustler, its publisher, Larry Flint, is the patron saint of cartoonists. When Hustler ran a spoof claiming that Jerry Falwell's first sexual encounter was with his mother in an outhouse, One. The right Reverend Falwell did the Christian thing and sued in a case that went to the Supreme Court in 1987. The unanimous decision was written by that famed pinko degenerate William Rehnquist, <laughs> who wrote that even though the spoof was outrageous, outrageousness in the area of political and social discourse is inherently subjective and that the court has long protected free speech, even speech that offends the audience. So the offended are left with the same option I use, free speech. They can and do write, call, picket, boycott, and draw their own cartoons, but in, in America, thank God and the Constitution, they can't claim special privileges and stop them damn pictures. Thank you.
Uh, against the proposition, Mari Matsuda. Thank you, Jeffrey, and thank you, Signe, for making us laugh and making my job so hard. Uh, it's really not fair to put me after the cartoonist, um, but I volunteered to go first. I'm sorry, I didn't bring cartoons, and I'm not going to make you laugh. I stand before you a censored person. Under American law, there are several things that I could not say. I could not attempt to sell you snake oil as a cure for cancer. I couldn't tell you secrets that I know that could make you millions of dollars when the stock market opens tomorrow. I couldn't tell a lie that would harm the reputation of any of the people on this stage. And I could not yell fire in a believable way that would cause a stampede for the exits. This point is the lawyer's point. In a complex society, law necessarily mediates between competing interests. Speech is one of those interests and it is profoundly valuable. But when speech comes up against other interests that are also valuable, we have no choice. We mediate, we draw lines, we balance. This is what we do. My second point is a humanitarian point, that words are weapons. They can assault, wound, degrade, exclude and incite harm of stunning proportions. I am a citizen born of the last century, one that had genocide right in its center. And that century will forever color my view of the harm that human beings are capable of. Propaganda is not a parlor game and rhetoric is not recreation. Words have consequences. I take words seriously enough to make them my vocation, and I believe that some words should remain unspoken. My third claim is that I am a constitutionalist and a civil libertarian. I believe that individuals exist prior to the state and that the state must remain accountable to its citizens. Thus, I am allied with my opponents in this debate in their healthy distrust on limits of speech. Indeed, if we had time to discuss the entire history of suppression of dissent in this country, my guess is that all six of us here on the stage would agree that the record contains many deplorable episodes. So why do I diverge on the particular question of assault of speech and urge you to vote no tonight? It is precisely because I value speech. As I see it, there are two main reasons for the First Amendment or for our protection of speech. One is simply that we respect individual choices. Each of us is sovereign over ourselves and entitled to express the cry of our own heart. The second reason is functional. We need democracy in order for our individual selves to thrive, and we need speech in order for democracy to thrive. Democracy requires that each and every individual speak, think, study, know, participate in self-governance. When hate speech and propaganda instill beliefs of inherent inferiority, the very things that the First Amendment is intended to protect are at risk. When racist invective keeps you away from a public hearing, as has happened, when sexual taunting keeps you away from a job, as has happened, democracy's prerequisites of mutual exchange and participation are gone. My students tell me, you've got to give examples. People don't understand without examples. So I'll give you one um, from the Asian American community. Right after the major San Francisco earthquake, the last big earthquake, the big one, there was a public debate about whether to rebuild certain sections of the freeway. And one off-ramp in particular that led into, China, into Chinatown was of concern to the residents of that community. And they turned out for a public hearing.